Yes. Present. Here. 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 Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. On this cool day in Columbia, right? <laughs> Good day to be inside. Up. So we have a few items starting with Ms. Alonzo's financial report. If you have any questions, she's here to answer those for you. Dear Benjamin, I apologize. We didn't do an invocation. So. Reverend? Please. Lord, for the beauty of this day and for all of the activities you've allowed us to endeavor ourselves this day, Lord, we pray for this city of ours, for those of us who sit around the table to hear and to make decisions that are viable for the health of this community. Thus, and, and in addition, we pray for this nation of ours. We pray for the children. We pray for families. We pray for situations that are in crisis. We simply ask that you might touch and energize and yet sensitize us to your will and to your way. Allow persons who are standing in blistering heat. Allow them to sense and feel today that a group of us are remembering the crisis. We ask it in your name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Yes, sir. Any questions regarding our April 2018 financial report? Seeing none, our first council discussion and the two after that center around our uh, homeless services, coordinated services uh, with three providers. They um, always are gracious to come and give us some presentations as we start a new fiscal year. And the first is the Regional Homeless Coordinator Services and Regional Inclement Weather Center. Ms. Jennifer Moore, Senior Director for Financial Stability Council for the United Way of the Midlands. Hey, Jennifer. Good afternoon. All right, Mr. Mayor, Council, City Manager, it's so wonderful to be here with you today. Um, what we wanted to do is give you a little bit of an update on the Inclement Weather Center contract and also regional contract for coordination of homeless services. Uh, so we're going to walk you through a few slides, but if you have any questions, please let us know. Um, we've been really fortunate and grateful to work with the city in partnership to address homelessness and also with some really amazing partners, which many are here today. Um, so thank them for also being here. All righty. So overview, there's actually two contracts. Um, one is for direct services, and that is for operations of the Inclement Weather Center, which provides sheltering for homeless adults, um, from November to March when it's 40 degrees and below. Um, we work um, with different partners there, and we'll talk about that. Um, and then also street outreach for people who um, are, are on the streets that we're trying to engage in care. Um, the second contract is our regional contract, and that is systems coordination and service coordination. So we'll talk a little bit about both of those. So first we want to give you a snapshot of kind of where we are in homelessness um, here in the, the Central Midlands. So we were really fortunate um, that during our annual count that we do at the end of January, um, we've had some pretty steep declines. Um, so from 2013 to 2008, we had about 8 to 9 percent decreases per year. Um, you can see from 2013 to 2008, which was a 40 percent total decrease. Um, but what we found this past year, from 2017 to 2018, our numbers basically were unchanged. Um, so we basically had leveled out this, this current year. And when we look at our inclement weather center numbers, we were higher in our unduplicated head count this year. So that's something that we're looking at um, so that we can analyze the trends there. You can see we've also had historically steep uh, declines in homelessness among our veterans. Um, we have a deep partnership working with VA and other service providers to um, implement that work. Um, we've been very aggressive in trying to secure new housing and street outreach for youth. And when we speak about youth, we're talking about 17 to 24-year-olds. And we're really targeting that population because we really want to end the cycle of homelessness um, very quickly for young people before they become long-term, chronically homeless people on the streets, um, which is some of the issues that we're seeing currently right now. 
Have you seen any decline in the chronic? Because that seems to be the, the population that mm -hmm. creates most of the issues for for both residents and. We'll talk about that. We're 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 pretty. We've dipped a tiny bit with chronic, but we're kind of holding steady with the chronic number. What Jennifer, the homeless, the veteran numbers, what, what, in real numbers, what, what, what do those look like? Um, about 155 this current year is what we counted. And so um, that obviously has come down quite a bit. And we've been working, of course, like I said, very closely with the VA. So we have a monthly case conferencing meeting with the Dorn VA staff. Um, as someone on the streets self-identifies as a veteran, we actually work with the VA to verify that they do have eligibility for services to try to connect them to that very specialized housing. Uh, the one thing that's we're fortunate with veteran homelessness is that is frankly the one place in the federal government that they have been very supportive with new resources. Um, and we are very fortunate that our Columbia Housing Authority, which is amazing, um, has about 450 units of housing specific to veterans who are homeless. Um, and so that's really helped us dip that number down over the past five years. All right, so the Inclement Weather Center. So we work with um, some really great partners. So Transitions, the Midlands Housing Alliance, is our primary entity that does the day-to-day -day operations of the center. Uh, we work with the Salvation Army of the Midlands for the evening and the breakfast meal. And then we have private vendors that uh, do security for us and transportation services. And we do transportation um, is required because the location of the Inclement Weather Center, we frankly don't want people crossing UG Street at, at night. Um, so we do pick up at the um, old, at the Clean Up Hearts location, which is by the new uh, Metro Police Station, which, by the way, we love that location. So talk about the summary real quick of the IWC. So uh, this year we had 67 nights of shelter compared to 65 last night or last year. Um, that included one night that Transitions um, did extend their hours and their, um, their day center for um, hurricane event. Um, not to mention the countless nights that they um, provided additional shelter in their lobby and other spaces just to get folks out of the elements when it was not quite the temperature ready below 40, but there were some severe weather um, incidents. Um, we were budgeted for 80 nights. Um, this year's headcount of unduplicated clients was 890 individuals. And again, these are adults without children. Um, that compares to 750 from the previous year. So you can see our unduplicated count did tick up a bit. Um, so that resulted in unduplicated or duplicated nights of shelter of about 8,700 compared to 6,300 last year. So we did tick up quite a bit. Um, that did have a bit of an impact on the budget. So we became very um, close on our, our meal budget just simply because of the higher head count. Um, our average per night also increased. So we were at 154 this year compared to 98 <coughs> last year. Uh, 98 had ticked down a bit. We were about 130 the year before that. So we did kind of tick down and then we've ticked back up apparently. And what's really kind of troubling to us is that we um, show that 55%, so over half of the clients have a disabling condition, and many have more than one. And so permanent housing placement that they can sustain on their own um, tends to be very difficult for us, um, especially with the, the severe limitations that we have of permanent supportive housing. And that's housing that um, is very specialized. It's typically federally funded. Um, and it would be um, a voucher attached with case management. And that's what Kristen's group does with USC Supportive Housing. They provide the case management element to some federally funded vouchers at the Columbia Housing Authority. And then we had 35 Excuse nights. Me. Yes, sir. What's the, uh, what's the <coughs> basis for triage mm -hmm. services? Mm -hmm. um, how do we bring that into focus? Mm -hmm. what, do we, what do we do? Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about our outreach efforts, um, but just briefly, um, a couple things. So to be screened for um, our, our very limited federal housing options and a, a bit broader array of services, we have a two-tier process. So one is a very brief screening that really anyone can do, um, just getting basic demographic information and what the situation is. And then we have a, a little bit longer uh, vulnerability assessment that we screen people for housing. And what we're trying to do is to get the folks that um, have the highest interactions with service systems, whether it be hospital systems, justice systems, um, who have a high um, vulnerability health-wise, to try to get those folks prioritized for housing first. 
so that we can get those posts off the street. That's basically how it works, and we'll talk about street outreach in a second. Does that help? So once that, once that, that two-prone process is taken, mm -hmm. taken into consideration and we've done it, mm -hmm. um, the next step is possibly a referral? Correct. So referral out to appropriate services, and for each client, that's very different. So sometimes it is a referral to housing. Um, we, we operate a prioritization of housing for people who are most vulnerable, um, again, with those very high service interactions. Um, so those folks are prioritized for housing. Um, but oftentimes uh, for folks that um, have a very challenging history or um, uh, a challenging approach to reaching them for services, sometimes it takes several different providers getting involved to coordinate care. Okay, so on the Inclement Weather Center, um, about a quarter of our, our, of our folks had positive exits. And so, again, that is about 172 that were placed in emergency shelter. Uh, most of those were at transitions. Um, many others were engaged with services with other agencies. Um, we had nine that were placed into permanent housing. But really, the issue that we have going back to more than half of the clients have a disabling condition. It's just very hard to find housing that they can afford or housing that um, meets their needs, because these are folks typically that need long-term voucher assistance and case management <coughs> attached to it in the form of permanent supportive housing. Questions on the IWC? So the regional contract, we wanted to back up just a second and give you a little bit of an overview of our United Way work in general about homelessness and then take a deep dive into the regional work itself. So we are the lead at United Way for our local homeless coalition, which is MOC, the Midlands Area Consortium for the Homeless. And really what that means is that we have a key role in coordination of services and planning um, across different agencies. So whether it be our, our partners with the City of Columbia's um, regional contract of services, um, but really a, a vast array of public and private entities in the community really trying to work on systems change and also to address those, those gaps that we have in housing and services and making sure that we're really connecting all the pieces together. Um, we also secure resources. So we coordinate an annual application to HUD. Um, that's about $3.1 million per year. And that brings in resources for permanent supportive housing and other types of housing services. And then at United Way, we invest over a million dollars um, to provide matching funds primarily for those federal resources. Um, we conduct the annual point in time count, which is the snapshot that we do every January, and that was that number that I said that was basically unchanged to the, the kind of that entry slide. Um, but that's where we train volunteers and we deploy them into the community to do a very in-depth survey that we deduplicate um, so that we can really look at trends of homelessness over time. But again, it is a snapshot. Um, it did, does tend to overrepresent populations, um, typically single individuals who that we encounter on the streets. Um, it does do, I would say, a vast undercount of families with children because those tend to be in doubled up situations um, and we don't have enough sheltering resources for them. Um, so, so it is a little bit of a, a skewed count, but it is one lens that we look at to analyze homelessness. Um, we also operate the Homeless Management Information System. So HMIS is our database that we use. So if you are in a shelter, that's how we record your shelter <coughs> stay. Um, if case managers put case management notes, that's how we make referrals across agencies. And that's how really agencies can track the history of a client through the system so that they can really understand the full picture. Um, we also do homeless research. So for example, right now, um, we are working on a youth study. <coughs> so again, that cohort of 17 to 24 year olds, we are matching HMIS data to public, our, our state public data warehouse at Revenue and Fiscal Affairs. So we are looking at things like juvenile justice involvement, foster care enrollment of young people who have experienced homelessness so that we can better understand that path of homelessness so that we can target those system and service interventions that are needed. Um, and then also system performance evaluation. So we use the information in HMIS to really get a picture of how our system is functioning. And so we can look at first-time homelessness on an annualized basis. We can look at returns of homelessness so that we can see how many people exit successfully to housing, but then cycle back through the system in a, in a six month or 24 month period. Um, we can also look at things like street outreach. We can look at the successful housing placements of those street outreach workers. 
which I've always said is the hardest job in the world, being a street outreach worker, um, do to get people into housing. So that's the big picture. Um, our team that works on homelessness at United Way, we have a six-member team um, that is funded. We have um, about a position and a half that are funded through the city regional contract. Um, the rest are funded through three federal grants that we have. Um, so we do have different roles for different folks, but we all, all are very interconnected. So diving into the regional contract specifically. So I was here back in March uh, talking about meal share coordination. So I'm happy to kind of look at any, any questions that you have there. But um, we have been fortunate that um, we've had the new guidelines up and running for Finley Park um, for about two months now. And that was where we truncated the slots for the meal share. So for example, uh, before on Saturday or Sunday, um, you could basically apply for a permit of, of really any time that you, you wanted. Um, now we have a breakfast, lunch, and a dinner slot. Um, and then if folks want to um, provide you know, services or meals in addition to that, then they partner with one of the lead agencies. Um, so again, that's been up and running for um, just under two months, but um, we've been really, really pleased with that. Um, we've been working on employment coordination. So we worked with Richland Library to host um, this year's second Breaking Barriers event. Um, so this is a, an event really to target folks who are homeless that have uh, background issues. So whether it's criminal, credit issues that prevents them from getting employment. Um, so we had 163 um, people at this event. Um, from that, we had 13 that uh, gained employment, 11 that enrolled in the Due uh, Workforce Investment Act program. Um, and then we had 19 that attended an expungement workshop with Appleseed, and we paid for sled checks that we did on site so that folks could understand really what's on their record. Is this the one Sewell Galbert's been working with you on? I'm sorry? Sewell Galbert. Sewell yes. been working. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, we also work on landlord coordination, so we've had um, a couple lease-up events with the Columbia Housing Authority, and we have a landlord leadership team. Um, and the purpose here really is to uh, win over landlords and to help them look past barriers. And so when an individual or family is looking to rent and they have those blemishes, whether, again, credit or criminal background, to really just give them a chance for housing. Um, the other thing that we did with um, a, a small pilot program with United Way Resources is we started the Peace of Mind Fund. And the Peace of Mind Fund is basically a risk mitigation fund. So if a landlord is very hesitant to release to lease to someone, then this is kind of an extra security blanket, an extra um, dollar amount that they can tap into if there's damages. And we've had really good success with this program, and I'm happy to report we've had no claims so far. Um, the other thing is our youth and transition work. So again, looking at our young people, 17 to 24, um, again, over the last four years, we've added 78 new units of housing um, and services, including dedicated street outreach. In um, addition to that, we were able to tap into a private grant from BB&T of $100,000 to um, target with our youth partners and also our family service providers um, to really help them kind of overcome barriers so they can kind of get to that next level as well. Um, new this year, we started working with Homeless No More to do motel vouchers for unsheltered families with children. And these were families, we, we really wanted to target this program very specifically. And these are families that are either referred from the United Way or um, identified by the police department, either after hours or um, when the shelters are full. Um, and it's a motel voucher um, just to get them off the streets. Um, this program has helped six families, which equated to about 26 children that were in unsheltered situations. Um, we're happy to report that of those six, then all are safely housed right now. So three went to shelter spots when those shelter spots opened. Uh, two went into rapid rehousing, and so that's basically a security deposit to get them back into housing. And one was able to find housing and sustain it on their own. Can I start? Yeah, sure. Yes. Uh, just a question on, yes. on that. So um, for the motel voucher programs, mm -hmm. how, how much money goes into that? How much are you budgeting for that? It's pretty small. It was 10000 this year, and I think we reduced it a little bit because it had a, a fairly modest start. So we reduced it a little bit, maybe to maybe five to 7000 this year. Because I would think, I mean, six families over a year. I, I hear a lot of families right. that end up, so I would think that, um, and because of the lack of, of shelter, um, and I know now that right. um, Homeless No More and, and the family shelter are, are together, mm -hmm. that hopefully will help, but... Um, I would think that that's certainly a, a net need in the past, and so I would love to see that. Um, but so with that, um, 
five ten thousand dollars does that include uh, the the case management for the families and then how long do they follow the family it does so the the process is so primarily the primary referral source is our is the Columbia Police Department officers um, this was something that we heard um, we, we convene monthly outreach meetings with our street outreach workers and CPD attends and one of the things that we did hear is that was a gap that officers were finding families with children and they didn't they didn't have resources and so that was a gap that we wanted to address this past year and we wrote we wrote that in with resources um, I will say that um, at United Way we also fund motel vouchers again it's a it, it's a it's a modest pot of money um, to, to be perfectly honest those funds can go just so incredibly quickly it, it's a delicate balance between satisfying those basic needs and then longer term issues like housing that we can put money into um, but the basic process here, so CPD identifies someone, um, homeless no more has a relationship with a very specific motel. Um, there's paperwork at the front desk that the officer um, completes, leaves it there. Um, a referral is made to homeless no more, which um, does a triage because again, they're, they're together now, which is amazing. And so family shelter would do the, the initial triage. If space is available there, they would be issued a spot there or you know one of our very limited other options like maybe family promise. Um, or they could be screened for other things like St. Lawrence Place or the rapid rehousing program that's operated also by Homeless No More. So, so the, that's the case management piece. The, yes. And, and so mm -hmm. six families, five thousand dollars. Yeah, they're not they're not quite spent down. It was a bit of a slow start, so that's why we kind of reduced it a little bit. Um, so they'll they'll probably spend out maybe not quite all of that money this year. We'll have a little bit left over. How do you? Excuse me. How do you determine the specific hotel that you're going to be referring the relationship to? The hotel? Um, I'm sorry? I'm sorry, the specific hotel? Yeah, how do you determine that? Um, is home there a list of hotels no, it's, or is it geographic? Or? No, there's one specific hotel that's uh, pretty centrally located and Homeless No More develops a whole relationship with them. Um, I guess it's maybe surprising or not, but it's it's kind of hard to get hotels to work with you on something like this, like a voucher program, because they don't know, you know, they're they're suspect that you're, you're not going to pay the bill first of all, um, but they're also such you know kind of cautious about who you may be putting into the unit. Um, so homeless no more, more worked with, uh, reached out to many different hotels, but found one that was willing to be a partner in the program. What are the boundaries? Um, it is in City of Columbia, I think, Don. It doesn't extend beyond the bridges. No, sir. No, no. It's just it's just Columbia CPD referrals is what it is. We we there has there has frankly been interest from other jurisdictions, and we said that we would be more than welcome to accept resources to do that. Yeah. So Jennifer, I'm, yes. and I I want you to finish your presentation too, but I want to get yeah. this question in. Oh, this is good. <laughs> you're, on, you're on deck first, so okay. I just, same question I'm gonna ask all of your counterparts mm -hmm. as well. So. Wonderful work. Let me just say that mm -hmm. up front. Always, partnership um, has been going on for many years now. Mm -hmm. Million dollars that this council has committed for multiple years. Right. These programs, everything that y'all are doing, the data that mm -hmm. you presented suggests that homelessness is decreasing in Columbia. You know my pushback. We've had mm -hmm. this conversation. Mm -hmm. To me, these things that you're presenting are working for those individuals who want the services. Mm -hmm. Hard question, what do we do and mm -hmm. what are we doing for the individuals who don't see treatment? So when mm -hmm. we are now facing, and, and I'm just I'm saying this because mm -hmm. this is a daily, if not mm -hmm. multiple times a day discussion that I'm having with business owners and residents mm -hmm. and, and our police chief. We're, we're, we are, from the city's perspective, mm -hmm. about to have to engage in some other Type alternatives downtown in particular and resources mm -hmm. that are going to be visible to people mm -hmm. that I'm not particularly excited about maybe having to do. But the aggressive behaviors mm -hmm. when we, I mean, not a day goes by, and I'm being dead serious mm -hmm. on this, including last night with my daughter. Mm -hmm. If we're approached by someone and we try to help humanely mm -hmm. provide all of the resources that y'all are outlining mm -hmm. and someone says, I, well, I don't want that, I've been there, mm -hmm. I've done that, this, that, and the other, mm -hmm. or I'm not from here. Right. What are we doing or what are we going to present mm -hmm. in this year's fiscal year mm -hmm. to do something a little bit differently 
to mm-hmm. help provide and, and make a difference in that regard. And I love a perfect segue. Okay. So, wasn't planned. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't rehearsed. Um, so motel vouchers were new this year, as we saw an emerging need. The other thing new that we're proposing for next year is to expand a travel voucher program. So at United Way, we have been funding a travel voucher program for probably about a decade um, through our partners at Salvation Army. And this is if someone is stranded here to help them with gas money or a bus ticket to get back to their home community. Um, What we do have proposed in our renewal request is to um, expand that working with transitions to offer that same service, that if someone um, has a home community that they can return to and they're um, uh, physically and medically able to travel on their own is to provide that 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 voucher for them. So that's one thing. I want to talk about street outreach real quick. Um, So we have worked coordinating street outreach um, for for several years now. Um, About a year or so, we started working with the solicitor's office. Um, The solicitor's office had a listing of individuals that had very high frequency of justice interactions. And our purpose there really initially started with our street outreach workers because we really wanted to um, kind of match those individuals with services when we could. Um, What we've done most recently is we've expanded that partnership. And so uh, we have worked with Columbia Police Department, specifically the Metro and the North Regions, to identify um, a small number of individuals that have frequent justice interactions, law enforcement interactions. Um, We have also are working with the City Center Partnership, um, the Public Defender's Office, and of course the Solicitor's Office um, to really link those individuals to services. Um, This is a pretty complex list of of individuals. Um, The purpose here, so so all the partners have a little bit different purpose, um, but we are coordinating together. Um, Our purpose here is to screen for housing. So when we started looking at the list, we found that most of these individuals, to your point, do not seek sheltering. These are the folks who are not necessarily going to transitions, even though transitions is full every day. Um, These are folks that at times will come to the Inclement Weather Center, but not always unless it's very cold. Um, So we wanted to screen them for housing because what we were finding is that these were folks that were scoring very high on that vulnerability screening tool that we talked about earlier, and that's how you get into those voucher programs. Um, The other thing is to connect people to services because we did find that that several or many people on the list were disassociated from providers in general. Um, And that we think that's from various, lots of different reasons. These are people who might have cycled in and out of programs over a long period of time and maybe had become disassociated or just dissatisfied with the system. And so we wanted to reignite and um, re-energize those connections to providers. Um, And then also to decrease the frequency of repeat offenses. And so a couple examples. Um, We have... We are working currently with the Public Defender's Office. So we have um, a PD who has um, someone who has frequent interactions with justice systems um, who's coming up for trial and could not be located. And so we would put an alert out to our street outreach workers to see if we could find this individual so that we could get her to her court date. Um, We had another individual who came up on that prioritized housing list and our housing provider could not find the individual. Well, come to find out, he was in Alvin S. Glenn the entire time that we were looking for him. So this was very clear to us that we had to increase those, those connections. Um, we're also talking with Alvin S. Glenn to, we've had a couple meetings with them um, to also increase that partnership there so that if we have someone who even though may not be currently associated with a service provider or a housing provider um, that is detained, that we can possibly get out there and do an assessment on the individual. Uh, The list itself is 74 individuals, and you can see we've only had this up and running for less than six months. Um, Twelve are housed. Uh, Forty-two we've been able to screen for supportive services, um, and that's that vulnerability housing assessment. And we have 45 actively engaged with street outreach. My my understanding is there's about 350 what you would categorize as chronic homeless in our community. Mm -hmm. And obviously a portion of those are more aggressive. More challenging, yes. Yeah, more Mm -hmm. challenging. What other options do we have? We can't Mm -hmm. force them into programs. Right. We can't push them into housing. Mm -hmm. But we have to do something that is um, clearly to change the culture of Mm 
of what's happening because right. it's affecting our residents, our patrons, our business people, right. our visitors. We're getting more and, and more mm -hmm. increasingly phone calls than I've ever seen before, mm -hmm. and the population seems to be shrinking, but this population right. doesn't right. seem to. Yeah, so let me talk about why the number, if, and it is about 300 or so that's chronically homeless. Uh, 74, we we had an initial list, again, from North Region, South Region, from CPD, uh, Public Defender, Solicitor, City Center Partnership, and there was some overlap, so we wanted to first deduplicate that list. So, I mean, you would expect overlap w with that. Um, and then we wanted to contain the list. So uh, really to try to focus efforts on this initial cohort of people. Um, I, I can tell you that every person on this list is a very challenging situation. Um, Two things. So an example of one thing that we're doing now with one individual who's on the list is we are engaging um, probably about six different service providers, um, including the public defender's office, uh, to get a, a, a very well-known person um, uh, into more stable housing currently. And it is um, very staff intensive um, because it is, it is very plan A, plan B. When those things don't work out, then we're going to try plan C. Um, so that's one example. Um, the other thing is that, you know, really I think regionally, this is a very challenging thing to say, but I think the lack of resources that we have for mental health in our community, um, paired with the lack of permanent supportive housing, is, is going to be a real challenge for us. So we do have excellent mental health providers with Mercy and the Palmetto Health Act team. Um, but I think that we could push for additional resources from other municipalities folks who don't want that help mm -hmm. that's our challenge I mean right. you know I don't think there's a lack of resources in our community okay I don't believe that okay. and, and I think we've seen it for a long time what I see is that we've got a um, a group of folks that we can't force legally or any other way mm -hmm. into taking advantage of this but they're mm -hmm. creating issues that are public safety issues. And we're gonna have to act at some point. So we need to come together and find out a solution because we're not gonna be able to, to tolerate it anymore. And no. that's a terrible way to look at it, but it's reality. No, it is reality. And, and let me be very clear, we don't condone bad behavior. So if someone's doing something illegal, um, we would expect that they'd be arrested. Now we know the complications there because you arrest someone, you're taking an hour of the officer's time at least to process them, get them to Alvin Esquilin, if they'll accept them. And then by the time Which the is not the end solution. It's not the end solution because it does nothing for anyone, exactly. So that's why we are trying to improve those connections with the detention center um, to make sure that we have street outreach engaged where they can. It's Street outreach is not an on-demand kind of thing. So if you get a call about someone um, at a local hotel that's causing something, we can try to get someone there as quickly as we can. But what's more effective for us is try to identify the person to see if they're homeless. Um, sometimes they're not. Um, to see if we can find them, identify them with our street outreach or in our database um, to engage them into some type of services. Um, I think what we have been talking internally and we would like to um, likely convene a meeting of, of different providers in the community pretty soon with city leadership um, to really kind of talk through some of these issues to see, to make sure we're maximizing all of the resources out there in partnership. It is a, a, a very targeted community and it's been a pretty, mm -hmm. pretty steady level for numbers. I mean, it's right. decreased a little bit and increased a little bit, but it's truly <coughs> coming to a safe issue. highlighting of the mental health issues yeah. because it's right. really much more profound. Yeah. And I was, uh, was going to ask that question. Right. The, um, and we, we, this is going to be a much longer conversation. I want to make sure right. we get through yeah. all the, uh, uh, I want to make presentations. Focus, focus. One of the things that, uh, <laughs> Apparently, Ed's chair is irritating Howard. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Mid-meeting mid, mid, mid uh, adjustment here. Now, this will start tweaking. It's going to really be an old one. It'll be you. Yeah. New chairs are old order. Can't get here fast. Right. Yes. Yes, yes, sir. And, look, and, let's, and then after that, let's... let's um, yeah. We've got, the different, we've got the different prongs in place. The justice piece, mm -hmm. the triage Mm -hmm. um, we've heard, we've, we've listened today that there are 300 persons, I think, that are aggressive and they have been active in terms of their 
interaction with CBD? Uh, that, I think the 300 really is people who are um, identified as what's called chronically homeless, and those, okay. that's folks who have been homeless for a long time okay. or multiple times over a period of years and would have some kind of disabling condition. So those, those are folks that's going to be challenging to find housing for because they are going to be very limited in their ability to support themselves on their own long term and, and often have very intensive case management needs. A little part of that, the, I think. The, I think the CPD list and the, the other list is 70 Seventy-four right okay. now. Yeah. Well, a part of that, a part of that is reflected in what takes place on Main Street mm -hmm. and several other places right. where uh, disturbances take place. Mm -hmm. I've heard all of that. I haven't. We haven't talked a lot. And maybe this is uh, time for another conversation. Mm -hmm. The psycho psychological piece mm -hmm. and psychotrophically, if persons are in a place in a dark place. Mm -hmm. There are going to be incidences of things happening on Main Street or in the Vista or anywhere else. Mm -hmm. How do we adequately find a way to psychologically do an assessment, whether whatever the disorder is, mm -hmm. and include that and make that a very real part? Yeah, of, that's a of, of the program. No, that's an excellent. Yeah, that's an excellent point. So we have three. Uh, assertive community treatment teams in our community, and those are called ACT teams. Uh, two are at Mercy, the Mental Illness Recovery Center, and then one at Palmetto Health. And those are multidisciplinary street outreach teams that have a psychiatrist and not a psychiatrist that sits in an office, one that's on the streets, uh, street outreach and case management. And um, they have very low caseloads. And to exactly your point, their purpose is to really do assessments and in-depth treatment um, of folks that have very complex needs but um, even having three teams it, it is it's, it's very limiting so I think we are probably at the junction that we need to kind of look at making sure that we're bringing all of our partners in to look at things all right thank you good I only have a funding slide next which is not interesting so if there are other questions please ask Um, just um, the, the budget where we are currently, we have one more month to incur expenses. Um, so again, we're, we're going to be slightly under probably in both grants, but um, just to kind of let you know where, where we are. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Is Thanks. there a way you could provide that report? I'd like to, what you just did, is there a, we don't have the PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Can yeah, you get so that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Our next report is an update on the Housing First program. Ms. Kristen S. Connors with Supportive Housing Services, Palmetto Health USC Medical Group. Yes, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, members of council, city manager. I know many of you, but my name is Kristen Connors. I work at USC Supportive Housing Services. And it dawned on me when I got here today that our program started as a pilot in 2008. So this will officially be the 10-year birthday or anniversary. Um, we started with 10 units, and we're now up to over 40. So a lot of progress has been made in maybe not a little bit of time, but enough time to where um, we're really excited to continue the partnership and very thankful for your support. Have it a slide, or you have it in a like a PDF? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Okay. So real quick, many of you are familiar with the Housing First model, um, but a brief overview, as the name suggests, we quickly move clients from homelessness into permanent housing, and it's nationally recognized as a best practice. Here in Columbia, we partner with the Columbia Housing Authority. They provide the apartments, they provide payments um, for rent and for utilities, and then we provide the supportive services. So Jennifer mentioned the ACT team, and it really talks about um, hard to reach individuals 
people who are very vulnerable, they're difficult to engage. So what we do is really have to accept the client's point of view. We patiently remove obstacles and then we'll provide ongoing follow-up. Sometimes if housing is not immediately available, we'll have to keep the clients engaged and we'll have to keep them interested and connected to our staff and to our services. I already mentioned that um, the folks are vulnerable, they're difficult to engage, so we'll have to meet the clients where they are. We'll go to shelters, we'll go to soup kitchens, we'll go to the woods, and then sometimes we have to get even more creative than that. We'll go to doctor's offices, we'll meet people in fast food restaurants, or we'll make the, meet them while they're waiting for the bus. This really illustrates the low barrier approach to housing first, and it increases the client's interest, and therefore their success. So I'm really proud that in addition to providing direct services, we value community involvement. We've participated in the police roll call. We've participated in provider nights down at the Inclement Weather Center, the point in time count. We serve as a mock access point, and Jennifer mentioned all of those in her presentation. We've participated in homeless court. We've had several successful referrals with our clients to homeless court. And then we partner with the Housing Authority to do a movie night, which is a good opportunity for clients to have a positive social outlet. Um, and we were thankful to many area businesses that donated pizzas and desserts, um, some door prizes. So that's something new that we started this year um, that we had good luck with. Next, the team for Housing First. We're all pretty cross-trained because it takes a village. Um, we have a case manager. We have a HAPWA case manager, and that stands for Housing Opportunities for People with AIDS. We have an outreach worker. We do mental health and substance abuse therapy. We have a medical adherence specialist, and this person accompanies clients to doctor's appointments. We get everybody hooked up with primary care and subsequently specialty care as needed. But this person um, provides what I call interpretive services. And so if the client is not necessarily comfortable communicating with the doctor and vice versa, this person can help alleviate that tension. Um, I serve as the director. And then we have a housing coordinator through the Columbia Housing Authority. So Housing First at Supportive Services, um, at Supportive Housing Services, we employ a scattered site housing approach. That means that units are located all throughout the city of Columbia. We utilize housing in apartment complexes. We do property management companies. We also work with private landlords. We try to sprinkle our units throughout the community and throughout all the districts in the city. We try not to have an overabundance of clients in one neighborhood or in one area. We also have 15 HAPA units, which is funded through the city's Department of Community Development. We, housing opportunities for people with AIDS. It's a specific funding source through HUD. Yep. Um, we have two two bedrooms and two three bedrooms. So. By and large, we focus on individuals, but we recently kind of expanded into some family units. And all of those units have a disabled person as the head of household. So, Kristen, the, mm -hmm. the actual two and three bedrooms, those are families. That's not a families. Single, it's not single homeless people you put together. Mm -mm. Nope, they're families. Uh, clients have to meet the HUD definition of homelessness, which means staying in a shelter or staying on the streets. So people who are staying with family members um, are considered doubled up. They're not eligible for these units. So the good thing on that is really the people who need it the most are the ones who we're targeting um, and selecting for the units. When people move in, we provide a starter set of housewares. So that'll be pots and pans, towels, dishes, cleaning supplies. We'll get a starter set of groceries through Columbia Metro Baptist. They're um, food bank, food pantry, and that's, I'm really thankful for that partnership because when somebody's lived on the street for so long, obviously they don't have salt and pepper and ketchup and flour and all that stuff that they need to get started. Uh, so we'll provide that as well. And then the Columbia Housing Authority will do furniture, so a bed, um, 
couches. We've had a lot of success with our neighbors donating furniture to the program. And that's always helpful, always needed. And the services that we provide are case management, mental health counseling and substance abuse support, medical adherence I already talked about. And then we also do support groups. And that's a nice feature because homelessness, I think, is a very communal experience. And I find that when folks move into independent housing, there's an isolation that goes on in the transition. So people can come back to the office and kind of work through that with folks in their similar situations. For this fiscal year, and these numbers are through around June 1st, uh, we've had 48 total placements, nine new move-ins, seven discharges, and 71% of those have gone to permanent housing, 258 encounters with outreach. On Mondays and Wednesdays, we provide walk-in services, so anybody who needs a place to stay, whether or not they're eligible for our program, or not, um, can meet with somebody and get pointed in the right direction, whether it be a shelter, a transitional housing program, um, either other, like Mercy and other providers that may not do housing per se, but if somebody needs to do their laundry or things like that, we'll point them in the right direction. The average length of stay is 671 days, which is 22 months. So you'll see there's not a lot of move-ins and not a lot of discharges. So when people come, they stay. And that's the goal of permanent supportive housing. So we're really proud of that. Client success just this year, I made a list of things that our clients have done to better themselves. You can see GED, driver's license, emotional support pet, a lot of income, disability benefits, or employment. People have access medical care, Volunteer opportunity, somebody left transitions and now goes back to volunteer at transitions, which I think is pretty cool. We've had families get back together, um, not so much in our units, but if somebody's been homeless for an extended period of time and were kind of cut off from their family, they now have pride and they can go back. Um, it's still an important American value, isn't it? I think so, yeah. Um, and then substance abuse detox and inpatient rehabilitation. So to finish up, I try to think about a story, you know, a, a really compelling story of somebody who's gone through the program. And I found this quote from our client satisfaction survey. And I think it does a great job of illustrating all that we do um, to encompass meeting people where they are. A lot of programs, I think, consider housing the end game, but we really work to start when somebody gets into housing. and We don't just kind of drop them. We continue to work. Some people are able to move on and find a place of their own and not need case management support, but a lot of people are not. That's from one of your clients? Mm -hmm. That's powerful. So, and I'll read it if, in case anybody can't see. All I can say is that the program picked me up, turned me around, showed me how to walk, taught me how to run, and I've been running ever since, not away from my problems, but to the solution. It's awesome to be a complete person once again. So, that's it. Any questions for me? Thank you. Thank for you for your support. Thank you for letting us come and share our success. Um, we're very passionate about what we do. We think the program is a great example of leveraging community resources. And look forward to working together. That number of, I thought it was either transitions or people that have. Exited? Yeah, yeah exited. That's just this year. Mm -hmm. This year. Mm -hmm. So. Um, those are good numbers. I remember um, the start of, of this. Remember that? David Parker came and pitched us the pilot. And um, my first knowledge of it was 
David Parker? Driving to um, town and listening to National Public Radio. Mm -hmm. And it was Tyler Van is one of them. It was new, a new concept. Mm -hmm. um, so the uh, um, transition from, from, from this to independent living, if you want to call it that. Right. Um, is there a follow along with those folks or do they? So after somebody officially vacates the unit, they'll get 30 days of case management support. But depending on the situation, part of the discharge plan will be to find out, do they need to go somewhere with a case manager? And if you think about it, if somebody's involved in mental health, well, there are case managers, you know, through those agencies. So depending on the support services they needed while they were. That's right. And it's everybody came in with a long list of complexities, and so they're all going to exit with hopefully a shorter list, but still an individualized discharge plan. Thank you. Our next provider is an update from Transitions Homeless Center, Mr. Craig Curry, Chief Executive Officer for Transition. Thank you. It's an honor to be here, and thanks for having me and, and be able to take a little bit of time. I've been told to take a little bit of time, so I'm going to try to expedite this a little bit. Um, if you hear nothing else that I say, thank you. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for helping transitions. Um, and I, I, we look forward to that continued support. What do you get when you help us? You get people out there trying to find permanent housing for people. You get outreach on the streets. So transitions people are out trying to find homeless people to draw them in. You get the inclement weather center. You get shelter beds every night. And we're like 99% occupancy, so we're full every night. Um, you get job searching, so we're helping clients find work. And you get the day center, which not only operates in the winter, but like say it's hot right now. So there's ice in the day center right now, there's air conditioning, and there's water the entire day. So you can get ice at 10 o'clock in the morning, or you can get ice at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, whenever you need it. And then meals. We served 244,000 meals last year, and we did that with the help of partners like Salvation Army. Um, here's a, a summation of success uh, since we've been open. Uh, we, we did hit our seventh birthday on Friday, so we had a party down there with the clients. We celebrate everybody's birthday on Transition's birthday. It's too hard to do everybody's individually, so we just do them all on June 15th. Um, and we were, it was a good milestone for us. We've put uh, 2,018 people into permanent housing since we've been open. Uh, we see 3,500 a year, so I know the point and count numbers, but if you look over the year, we touch about 3,500 plus unique people every year at Transitions. So there is a need. Um, the 260 beds are full almost every night. And we have 50 great partners. United Way is one of them, and Mercy, and uh, Goodwill. I could sit here and, and name lots of folks, but it, they do a great job, and they help us uh, quite a bit. And then that last one, the youth number, we've had, we have our own youth program that supports what United Way is leading for shelter beds for youth. Youth for us are 18 to 24. We don't take the 17-year-olds. But again, they can come in in those 16 beds and get immediate placement. Colonel, tell me, tell me that 6502, what does that number mean? Um, because obviously if you look at unique clients served, those with the permanent housing, and those who progress to more positive living. 6502. Okay, so those are mean? progressions off the street, but not to permanent housing. Okay. So permanent housing, the 2018, is actually a positive outcome, too. So all the positive outcomes at Transitions are 8,520. Okay. 
I always get asked about this, and, and you all usually ask it, so I just put it up here to save the question. Um, it, it, the, the story about everybody coming on buses, I, I don't accept that at all. I really don't. And this has been consistent for seven years. Almost, now, the numbers fluctuate a little bit, but generally, predominantly Richland County, period. Some Lexington, about 10%, 11%. It dropped once to 9%, but it, it holds about 10 or 11. And then the other counties of South Carolina that are not Mock, or not Lexington, I should say, or Richland. And then out of state's about 10. It's about 10%. Do some out of state people come? Yes. Generally, they've come back because their mother grew up here, or they were children here, they went to New York, and the, the big dream didn't happen. You can see the gender, race, and age numbers there. And veterans were 9%. Craig, before you move on, I, I did think about that question when Jennifer was talking. So the travel program for the next, so could y'all be focusing on that 28%? Or I was just wondering, is there, because I've always heard these numbers, is that a program that will be We've done it to a limited degree, but the funding always runs out every month, so then it stops. So if, if there are more people and the family agrees, we don't want to just randomly put people on buses. We want some sort of family linkage at the other end. And we'll work that hard. I'm excited that that's a possibility. Okay, so we've asked questions here. Let's see, I've got times moving on. The outreach piece we do. So... Ms. Wilson asked about, okay, what do we do mental health-wise? So I put mental health and I put substance here. These are self-admitted numbers upon entry into transitions. So one of the pictures I want to paint for you is everyone at transitions isn't really doing well. There's a lot of mental health issues there, and there's a lot of substance issues, and a lot of them have both. So these are very high numbers. So... Serious and persistent mental health is pretty much what these folks fall into. They need medication for their schizophrenic, bipolar, serious depression. So now the other 66% have issues too. They've been traumatized. They're just not necessarily serious and persistent health and need medication. They probably need counseling. I've had people tell me that 90 plus percent of the people at transitions need some sort of psychiatric help. So this is a focus and a snapshot. So what are you getting for this, and how are we going to change and do better next year? We're going to help with the outreach. We work with United Way on that, but we do have a person who goes out to try to find the mental health. We're chronically about 14% homeless. So don't think that everybody in transition is at a higher level and all the chronic people are on the street. That's, that's a misrepresentation. Chronic folks will come into transitions, and we actually house some of them. But they are much, much harder. Okay. And a lot of it takes way, way more time, generally, for them to adjust and overcome barriers. So, Craig, so first of all, 34% mental health cases, are those actual open cases, or people who have mental health issues subbed out? They have issues and cases. And cases, okay. But that so they are getting help. I mean, the good thing is they immediately must go to one of the providers to get help. So that's out of how many, what's the what's, uh, um, unique number, say, for about last 3, year? About 3,500 that walked in last year. So we're talking about between mental health cases and substance cases, it's going to about 1,000 people. Easily. Just over 1,000, okay. So I'm just, I, I don't, I'm trying to paint a rosy picture here. I mean, this is hard. This it's, is it's, hard it's, a, it's illustrative of the challenge. So, I mean, there's a lot of folks in there who need help. The ACT teams have been mentioned. They do a great job. Mercy, they come in and help as well. So we're trying to get the chronic folks, the more serious, persistent mental health, pushed into a permanent housing solution immediately. Having a shelter bed is key because if you know where the person is, you can work with them much easier. If they're under a bridge somewhere, it's really hard to find them. And some of the folks are kind of easy to find if they're panhandling on Main Street. But again, there has to be some sort of willingness. And that is a problem. And at the end of the day... The success stories that we're hearing today are great, but 
we still have that one population right. that we all struggle with, and we've got to come up with a solution. For and I'm, I'm with you, and I, I support that. But again, you don't want the 2018 people no. on the streets, too. No, that's why this, you'll this be worse than Miami. CDs, yeah, yeah but, but at the end of the day, we know these folks are getting what they need, and we're able to reach them. But we got a group of folks who, who, who are either, resistant, who are either right. resistant that's right. or or just they're going to be that way. And we got to. But the encouragement here is you do wear some of these people down. The 14 percent that are in transitions right now are getting worn down in a positive sense. It's like, OK, look, I don't have to keep doing this. And then they start taking their medicine and they start listening to the counselors and it, it starts to work. It may take time. Everybody, it's not an immediate solution for everyone. So we've been pushing that and working that hard. The veteran population, we work extensively with the VA. Some cost figures there. Uh, we're one of the best deals in town in terms of where to spend the night. Uh, some cost, Eau Claire Health Cooperative, they save 7 to $8 million a year in charge at the clinic that they run on transitions. Having stuff on site leads to better health care and easier access. 60 to 70 tons a year of food that we get from Fort Jackson, we get from USC, Rawls Farm, McIntyre Produce. That's food that would go in a landfill. So again, that is a cost savings to the community with that number as well. Volunteer hours, we have lots of folks volunteering the transitions. That has grown every year. Um, and then clients in our jobs program as well. That's it, Mrs. McGill. That was pretty close. But <laughs> Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you. Um, any I think it's ideal for. Sorry. You're getting those asking I think it's ideal, ideal for us to uh, to say that the providers and what you've given us this morning is very understandable. I think the larger picture, though, is how do we get beyond some of the hurdles. How do we get beyond those hurdles where we uh, where we have the necessary psychotropic drugs that are going to help some of these out there? Uh, and until we sort of blanket them with the kinds of uh, triage care that is both justice related, psychotropically related, and uh, until those relationships are sort of built in and we are able to see uh, a changing of the guard or a changing of the paradigm, we're going to find ourselves in a tough set. Uh, somewhere I read that the homeless are always going to be with us. Can we do a better job of that? Uh, can we easily say that, and, and I'm very appreciative. And I know, Mr. Mayor, you've mentioned we, we need to have a bigger conversation about um, what we as a city plan to do regarding the, um, the problem of aggression and, and what's happening. I think we're all seeing it. Um, and as Ms. Wilson said, I mean, every day we're, we're getting things. I'm, I'm calling law enforcement <laughs> all the time in my office for situations that we're having happen at, at um, Richmond Street. But I will say that um, as we have this conversation and engaging our partners, um, it's going to be important. I know sometimes I've, I've had to reach out to Craig and, and he's put his outreach people out um, to, you know, contact people who are sleeping on porches and other things. And they've been not always 100% successful, but has been able to talk to the people, have them come in and other things. So um, as we talk about the bigger issue and, and come up with some solutions, maybe um, engaging their street outreach a little bit more with helping us get some of those folks 
um, in the system or making it very clear that you know what's been happening to this point is no longer going to be tolerated in the city. Thank you. Just as we close out, I wanted to say and thank, thank you. And thank you all. Um, but I continue. I know we've had some great conversations the last couple of weeks of just working together even more closely. Uh, provide some type of a, of, a, of a seamless approach to dealing with these uh, challenges. But we've, we've appreciated your partnership. I, I, think, I think Matt's back there somewhere, too. Uh, we're going to continue working through this. Um, Sarah, thank you um, as well. Um, you know, when, when, you, when you're dealing with, you know, just incredibly challenging uh, realities of the human condition, it requires a, a really thoughtful and compassionate uh, response that, um, uh, that can seem difficult at times. Pledge to continue being a good partner in this, but it's going to require us working that much harder, that much, that much harder. Um, I don't ever want y'all to think we don't we don't appreciate the hard work you guys you guys do. Let's let's all step up our game that much more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank y'all. Missy. Well, I was going to. I'm not going to try to top what you just said, but wanted to, I did to add that um, Miss Sarah Fawcett is with us today. She is. The new executive director for United Way, as of a year ago now, though, so I do want to make sure that we acknowledge <laughs> that. Right, but making sure everybody, all of councils, had a chance to realize that. Thank you. Thank you, Missy. Uh, we have uh, another big discussion today. I know it was requested by council that we go ahead and at least put on the agenda for the work session give you some time to talk through our fiscal year 2018-2019 accommodations and hospitality tax grant funding recommendations. I think the discussion um, that you all are wanting to have during the work session is probably a little bit bigger than just the actual spreadsheets, which will appear on the, your agenda tonight for a uh, council vote. Dee Dee Fanning is with us. She's your grants coordinator and community projects liaison. Um, Dee Dee's worked really hard as she got through the process with the committee, and the committees work really hard, as they always do, but Dee Dee does have some observations, recommendations, guidance that she can give today, or we can, um, you know, just really take council's lead on what you want to talk about at this point, and she can chime in as she sees if you have questions. Um, I know Mr. Rickman, Mr. Duvall, you all both had some Suggestions, and I'm not sure if this is the time you want to get into any of that. If you want to hear from Dee Dee first, I think we should hear from Dee Dee first. Okay, very good. And I want to, I'll, uh, I'll be glad to hear from Dee Dee first, but I'd like to hear from um, Missy second. Okay. To explain the funding the budget. The budget. Certainly. How she came up with that. Yes. Sir. Um. Good afternoon. Uh, what I mainly wanted to speak about, um, the current process that we have in place, I know there were some questions that you had discussed in moving forward and how we do that. Um, I won't get into a whole lot of detail because I think we need to work with you as we move into the new year to go over. We do have things in place, the statement of assurance that it must be eligible expenditures that we use for the organizations. Um, so to go over things as we go into place with the recommendations once they're approved for the new year, um, it will be a process that we go through. Um, what I have up here is just a breakdown of the slide that we presented previously with the committee process. Um, we have the city guidelines that we currently use and, of course, the state guidelines that we currently use. Um, I really wanted to answer any questions that you, because we had discussed it, but I wanted to get some direction on specific questions that you had for me in the direction that you wanted to go. You had discussed organizations over the 50,000 mark. Um, do you have any questions for me that I could answer and give you some direction on what we currently have in place and what we had went over before? Yes. Well, I had I had hoped that we would be able to come up with a new way, uh, a better way of doing the H tax, particularly the A tax, is much simpler because it only has two agencies involved in it. But 
I'm not sure that's the will of the council. One of the one of the uh, key points that that I think would have made this whole process easier if it was would be to change the the um, the way the agencies receive their funds and how they have to account for the funds. Uh, but understanding from my friends in the finance department that they want to have all of the munitia uh, sent to them. And uh, if we're going to continue that, and if we have to continue that because of audits and everything else, uh, I think we're going to have to recognize that Dede is going to need some more help. It was a two-person shot before, now it's a one-person shot. And if we're going to ask her to go through every receipt for 10 gallons of gas for everybody that's doing this, um, I think I think we need to give her some support. The other thing is Mr. Rickman wanted to look at the requirements for for uh, reimbursements, uh, and this is this is off our registry, uh, off our website. The eligibility of the uh, hospitality grant guidelines, and I look through it, and if if the will of the council is that we got to continue the way we've done it. I think this is mighty bad um, set of guidelines. My, my biggest beef, I think, would be that it boils down to it's what the reviewing person thinks should be uh, uh, Funded. reimbursed rather than a set thing because it says examples of generally ineligible expenses list a whole lot of things and then it several places in the guidelines say that, that each individual agency look, is looked at different um, and so they have the, the I reckon it would be Didi or Didi and, and somebody else would, would have the authority to say well this is an acceptable expense and this is not an acceptable expense. The one that gets me the most is the rentals. Uh, Examples of generally ineligible expenses are rentals, uh, stages, tents, tables, and chairs. Uh, maybe tables and chairs I could see, but if, if you're going to fund an event that's going to have a performer and you have to have a stage, it looks to me like that would be an eligible expense. And uh, right now it's not. So if we're going to have, if we're going to keep the strenuous reimbursement couple of those um, things. Another one that got me was uh, ineligible expense would be maintenance and upkeep of property. Well, that is clean and safe. And um, I don't see how we could use that as an ineligible expense and still say that it's uh, eligible under the clean and safe. It's three of our I'm a little frustrated. Uh, I, I, I don't. I don't like the way that the money has been divided up this year. And I sat down for two or three days and went through it, and I couldn't figure out how to do it better. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there are pieces here, there, and yonder that I can pick at. But overall, unless we give them more money, I don't see a whole lot of differences that that, that I would be able to suggest on. Redividing the money in some other way. I wouldn't on the A tax, however, uh, if you want to talk about A tax too at the same time. My understanding was the A tax was to be divided 85% to the convention, to Experience Columbia, and 15% to Lake Murray. And that's, um, that's, that's not the way it's divided this year. And I'm, I'm going to try to get three other votes tonight to change that back. So that they do have 85-15 split, and that they, the whatever surplus is split 85-15. We went through this debate last year, and, and I think that um, we should stay with 85-15. I don't have a long history in this thing, but that's what I have been told, that it's always supposed to be 85-15. That's what we used last year. We did have an increase um, for the committee for ATAX this year, um, so, and we can't go over what the 
organization has requested, not talking about the surplus part of it, but just the original what the committee would recommend. Um, so we, we wouldn't be able to go unless they increase their request. That's one thing we have to make sure of when we consider the 8515 or that we have done in the past. Um, the hospitality guidelines, the eligible and ineligible expender, expenditures listed on there, those are what we have used in the past from what council approved, but it's been a very long time since those were reviewed again. So if there were changes that we wanted to, that council wanted to make to those, we would need to do that and organizations would be held responsible to abide by that going into the new year. Well, um, I looked at the list of ineligible expenses, and I agree with most of them, except mm -hmm. for the, maybe the rentals and maintenance and super property. Uh, the rest of the, <coughs> the other one was staging. It's got staging and, all, and fencing. I can see fencing not being eligible, but staging. If, I, if a staging is what I think it means, you're sponsoring an event, staging ought to be allowed to and again, that was that was decided by previous council. If I'm, if I recall correctly, it may have been um, 2013, 2014, when all of these were approved at that time, and that's what we followed. Yeah, I mean, I think we need to revisit how we. Distribute. I think the requirements. I think that you know one of the requirements is supposed to be that 990s and everything are update. And my audit, I grabbed a handful of them, and that is not the case. Um, I think that we're reimbursing on items we shouldn't, um, and that's a problem. And that's why I don't feel like we can just leave it open and then have to go audit on the back end. Um, we've got to re-examine the way we're distributing money. And we've got groups that have money in the bank. We have groups that have other sources of bank, but we continue to increase theirs. It limits our ability to provide uh, adequate funding for other groups that are trying to grow. We've been talking about this since the day this came out. And it gets to a point where, a certain point where, you know, you need to be standing on, on your own feet. Not completely, but when I look at this and I looked at some of these reimbursables, I was very put away that I'm paying for somebody's Mountain Dew and their toilet paper. That is not, to me, an expense that should be paid for with hospitality money. This is the idea to drive events and people into town. You know, signage and, and things like that are proved. There are other communities using this money in a different way. West Columbia allows a new restaurant to hold their money until they can pay for the grease trap, a way to attract people there so they can create more money in the pot. That's an interesting thing, but at the same time, we've got groups. I went through, I mean, this is one packet of somebody's I went through, and look at, I got so many stickies on it, I can't, and I don't understand why we would reimburse for some of this. I think we have to take a serious look at how we fund all the groups, what the time frame is, what their sources are, what what are they spending the money on? What are they spending their other money on? You know, to me, if you're a nonprofit, you're a nonprofit. And we're supposed to be encouraging, and there's a lot of Somebody's calling me. They must have heard me on the news on the microphone. But when the when the committee considers these, they do they do go through all of those things um, that that are included in the application to look at who can be self sustainable and um, who who really. Of course, they all need the money, but who who is self-sustainable, who's not with allowing new groups in, um, making sure all areas um, are covered and being diverse, and all of the things, um, the attendance, the what it brings back to the community, everything that they have to compare and try to do that the best way that they can, and I think they do a really good job at that, and they, in the recommendations for this year, you will see some that were decreased that they felt 
were self-sustainable and to give room for others. There were new groups coming in. And I think we as a city probably take the blame for a bulk of it because we've allowed some of these expenses to be reimbursed in the past. We've got to come up with a better system. We need to make sure that we're increasing that pot and that we're driving people to increase that because there are areas of town that we're not supporting as strong as others. And there are reasons for it, but it also, there's also parts of town that are, are, are thriving and at the same time, they're, they're reaping the benefits and we're not being able to spread it out. Uh, you know, I don't want to get into every detail, but it's a it's pretty shocking story when you take the time to go through and look at this. And that's why I'm really concerned about just giving the money you know, on a two-year cycle and we don't funnel through it. Obviously, we need to fix our system on our end. Yeah. Uh, as well, so I mean it's a twofold, and we've allowed some of it to happen. But I also think we got to tighten up the criteria. I mean, if you're a group that's got a, a bundle of money in the bank, then we shouldn't be funding you at the same level. Mm -hmm. You've got other sources of re income. We need to fund certain programs and and so forth. I get that, but at the same time, it was never in created and meant to just provide a cushion for everybody. It's supposed to help continue to grow, and we need to, to, to spread it out. I appreciate the committee's hard work. I think a lot of what I'm talking about lies on our end of the table. And I think the, ma Just, the majority of the expenses for the main ones, and my concern as well, would be the um, programs like the Clean and Safe, where it, where it may get more into the gray area. The majority of the organizations funded that it's for media, advertising, and promotions, it's more clear cut than it would be for the clean and safe and operations of those programs that we sh that we need to get a clear idea mm -hmm. of what we need to do. And I am working on some things um, to make it a little bit easier for the the organizations to access. Um, a form that they can fill out when they make the request so that it's not just turned in. They're doing this, you know, just for some organizations once a year when they have their festival. And they, they're asking for grants from other places as well. So it's it's having to get with them and, and remind them and help them. But working on, one thing I am working on is making that more accessible to them. Um, for instance, online so that they can get that as well as speaking to me or whoever here. Um, to have guidance on that um, and just make it a better process the best that we can. Is, is there on that form anything that would identify the amount of money that I carry over? I think this is what you're asking, Danny. The amount of money that I carry over and what is requested and what that percentage is and how does that percentage affect the amount of money that they're requesting? You t are you speaking of funds that they, they're requesting to carry forward in the next year? We usually do not have many of those. If we do, it's usually um, for a special reason, and they will send a letter in explaining that, um, whether it be, um, I know we've had one before that there was a change in who was over the entire program, and there were some things that fell through the cracks, so they asked that they could um, carry that forward to start the process again for the event that it was, um, but for different reasons, and they'll usually copy counsel. If not, the, the letter that they send me, then I will send to you as well, but, but with an explanation. But it's a very small amount yeah. of groups that I think Daniel's talking about. I think Daniel's talking about okay. carrying forward money. I think he's talking about like organizations that their event is so successful, they actually make money, and then they set aside money. But then we also give them, money. Give them money, and so I think and that's that's percent. what he's talking about. So, to Ed's question, um, do we have some way in our application, or are we asking for um, what monies they already have set aside for this, so that we know if they do still need the same we amount do. that they ask us for? We do. We have that is one of the things we see in our application, and that is something that the committee will see as well, and um, they will know, cover that with the. Um, organizations as they came, know, came in and give their presentations. So it, it will show that for each application. I, um, let me, let me, I'm going back to uh, 
my usual observations. And I still don't understand um, how the committee uh, continues to, I guess, um, not consider the smaller organizations worthy of uh, increased funding. Um, I'm going to point out two in particular, but there are more. Um, the North Columbia Business Association and Eau Claire Community Council. Um, and I'm pretty much agreeing with Daniel uh, some of these points. One, the intent is that you don't, you're not supposed to sub totally survive off of these funds. Um, and that um, if that continues to happen with this larger organizations continuing to get the same large amount of money, the smaller organizations will never get anything. Uh, they, they don't have and then they don't experience the opportunity to grow. Um, and I think we need to take another look at that. Um, and it's a question of how long are you going to be <laughs> operating off of these dollars? If that continues, newer organizations can't get in line, can't get, get to the table. Um, also, um, I don't know, I'll throw this out there. I'm looking at. Um, Several of the uh, minority organizations, they don't tend to get anything. I think the committee ought to take a look at that. Um, the intent is that uh, if we want to see other areas of the city show their wares, um, then they ought to have an opportunity to participate in these dollars that they can use to attract organizations, attract people, and also businesses uh, look at areas when they're considering an investment as to what's going on, what's happening, and whether or not that's going to be a pleasant for them, pleasant place for them to, uh, to, to invest. Uh, until we consider that, then it's the same old, same old. It was about, it was just seemed to me that it's about, it has to be about Equity, it's got to be, it's got to be. Absolutely. There has, to, there has to be the whole issue of equity as it relates to new business, new organizations coming in. Uh, and I'm sure all of us around the table got organizations that we could perhaps look at it as it relates to what you just said, uh, Sam. But it's, it's, it has to be an issue of, of, of equity. And how are we going to feed in the organizations that, uh, the bottom line, we just, we got to start doing business as it's, usual. As usual. And I think that's, that's the bottom line. But, you know, as I reflected just auditing and what I've come to realize is that a lot of our issue is right here at the city. And it's not, it, it we've got to, to have stronger guidelines with ours. I mean, you just read the guidelines, food and beverage, well, and how are these people getting reimbursed? I mean, we've gotten complacent or more comfortable with folks, and I think you're going to see a reduction of what's reimbursable by us following our own guidelines, but we need to follow it to be fair in the system. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I think we, we have to improve our guidelines. I think we need to look at all aspects, because there's a certain point, you know, there's been a lot of discussion over the years even five, six years back about, you know, in your funding groups, you know, where are they spending their dollars, you know? And, and, and if we're investing so heavily in one group, but yet, you know, we're unable to, to help grow others. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember when this was pushed by the arts community, this was a, a push to help grow tourism, arts, and other things that became a funding. It, I don't think it was ever meant to be a permanent funding. Right. But there are also groups that, that contribute so much by what they do to help grow that we need to continue funding. So it's a fine balance. I think what we have for guidelines, and I think our process here, has got to be updated and fixed. And, and, and I feel like a lot of it is on our side of the fence. Um, 
and we need to send that message clearly because I think people have been able to get reimbursed for stuff. They've asked for it. We've just done it. That's a problem because that's taking dollars out of other people's mouths. Well, I, I, I hope that when you made the analogy that uh, folk are being reimbursed for toilet paper and Mountain Dew, I hope you're just kidding. No, I'm not. Let me ask this. That could be a dubious mm -hmm. process, my brother. If an organization has a, shows a surplus this year when they come to the table, do we take that under consideration and, uh, against their request? Never. Or do we totally look at their request and not, not make a decision based on surplus? Surplus of these dollars. It's taken into consideration. But what we have to, it's also taken into consideration with the, all of the other aspects of, like Daniel was mentioning, that everything is taking, for each organization, all of those are if taking. Or, if an organization is putting away money because they have a capital campaign, that's a whole different mm -hmm. discussion. But when an organization is putting away money and they're, they're meant to thing, but we continue to increase it and we've gone from providing money for one one aspect to another aspect, to me, that's an issue. And then when that aspect gets to a point where you're paying, you know, for expenses that, that aren't qualified, they may, they may look minor now, but when you add it up over the course of the year and you add it by the multiple groups, that's money that we could increase. You know, and you've got organizations that, you know, may have had some not great successes, but at the same time, I think we have an obligation to try to help them grow. Um, you know, it's just, it, it is a fine line. I get it, but I think we're at a point where this has been around long enough that we probably need to, to have a hard look at how we distribute it. Ms. Devine? And I think that's one of the reasons we asked Teresa to put it on a work session, but she, even today I don't think we can do all we need to. I agree. Um, because we need to really, I mean, we have these number of years of experience, we probably can get into it and maybe re, re, retool some of the guidelines based on what we're seeing. Um, but I would say two points to what Daniel said. One thing is that I think that's, that's the reason why Howard thought about a tiered approach, because it's hard to, to compare a five points association with an Eau Claire Community Council. Um, you know, they, they both put on a day event, but they're, they're different. Eau Claire Community Council isn't where Five points is five points shouldn't be penalized because they've been successful, um, but in the same token, Eau Claire shouldn't be penalized because they don't have the years mm -hmm. of experience. Right. So I, I think that you have to look at them and maybe it, it, lump them together so that you've got groups on maybe the same the level playing field competing. Um, so whether we look at Howard's proposal if we can or not, or, or maybe look at what we want to do to address that, that that would be one thing. The second thing I would say for that, though, is um, my one little caveat on people setting money aside is because of the way we do our funding, and depending on when someone's organ um, event is, sometimes they can't rely upon whether or not we're going to fund them and at what level. And so I do think that we need to encourage groups to get to the point where they're setting aside seed money for um, future years. Now, the question is, how much is that seed money, and are they, you know, setting aside, you know, thirty thousand dollars and using it for other projects, or are they putting aside, you know, ten thousand to do their contracts because they never know what we're going to fund? I, I think we've got to look at that in a different situation and ask the real questions as to what they're doing with that money. I think we need to we need to encourage them to be financially savvy about saving money for the future events, but we also don't need people to set aside their money, expecting our money. So that's something I think we would need to ask. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't have a problem with that. And, you know, the capital projects, you know, I think we all understand how that works. But if, if it's these dollars, if you're sitting on it, then someone that's new to the table is not going to be able to get any money. But it's not sitting on it. So say if, the, if say it's the a surplus analogy. and you're in line for additional dollars, it's well, a surplus. Well, but I think you're saying surplus. There are two different things. You, you didn't spend be, it 
you didn't spend what you requested last year. Okay, that's different. What I think what Daniel was mentioning, and correct me if I'm wrong, is so again using not to not to put the bit, but using five points. We know that you yeah. know if it doesn't rain, they're successful, and so they will uh, rightfully so set aside some money so that they can self insure. You know, yes, that's so, that's, that's so, well, so that, but so they can get things up and running for the next year because of look at you know when we start. Uh, when we allocate the money, they're they're planning already for March, and so they can't wait to June or July to say, okay, what's the city going to fund us? So it's wise for them to put money aside. Um, you know, we've had organizations in the past that hadn't put money aside, and then we give them money they weren't uh, looking for, um, they were expecting more, and they have to cancel the event, or they're coming to us because they went ahead and had the event and had a deficit, and they're coming to us asking us to, to pay for that, and so. I think it's wise for them to set money aside, so that's different than having a surplus where you know they had dollars and they didn't spend. Okay. So I think we need to look at that in two different aspects. Yeah, I, I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't argue that. I agree with you, but I think we ought then to to consider the circumstances. Rain, fine, but that's understandable. But but if you know for some reason you 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 you, you had a successful event. Um, you did, and you did not spend the dollars that you requested. If it's thirty thousand dollars, then that thirty thousand dollars that's sitting in the bank ought to be considered next year. Ought to be looked at. Well, they won't get the thirty thousand yeah, dollars. So they, they won't get, get that. They won't get the thirty thousand dollars unless they can spend it. The money I'm well, talking about is from different revenue and and when you other income. Other yeah, income. That, that, when that when you're, I, you have to take that in account on what you're given. And when somebody continues to grow that mm -hmm. that line item, but yet their mission is is strictly driven for a certain purpose and a certain thing, we got to look at all the aspects of the organization. And, and you know, and all, it came yeah. up with one of the big orga organizations before, where and that director is no longer here. I'm not going to say it is, but you know they were making a quarter of a million dollars a year, and you got you got a question at that point. You know when you're paying salaries like that, do you do you really need this money? Because I mean that's not what it was designed for. You're the boss now. A couple of things. Number one, you got to remember that the hospitality tax is designed to be given to to groups to bring tourists into the city. And tourists, most of the time, tourists is considered somebody that's gone 50 miles. Our guidelines say people from outside the city limits coming in. So some of these groups that are getting these... It's a tourists, long walk from here to West Columbia. I know. But uh, <laughs> you got... It. That's the intent. Yeah. And, and the second thing is a little uncomfortable for me to be talking about what I'm talking about because John's sitting behind me back here and it's actually his... <laughs> yeah, his I, idea. I support that. Uh, John's we, idea was to have have a base funding for the big groups like CMA. I think John says we need to have a world class museum, which we have. We need to have world class historic buildings, which we have. We need to have a world class phil philharmonic, which we have. And so he was putting those into a tier. Maybe we ought to ask John to speak about his thing, but. That's how I came up with the tier, is to get the base right. agencies up there and treat them a little differently than, than the people that are going to need a little bit more help. But at the same, same time, time, some of the, some of the issues... issues. We, 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 we discussed it, but we never came back to it. And, and uh, I'm, I'm totally in favor of that. You know, um, I'm, yeah, I'm in favor of that, that too, <laughs> the tier concept. But I'm also in favor of making sure it's equity. As yeah. we discuss it, if we got a tier here, what about the second tier? Well, the what second about what 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 about those organizations who are very very close to making something happen, and they and the funding is not there, and there's not quote unquote a savings account that is already established. But nothing is get. But none of this is guaranteed. Yeah, right. next so, year, I mean, we so got you, massive you, you, you have, now. So that way, you can be flexible uh, when you observe certain circumstances with organizations and certain events and certain areas of the city. So, you, so we buy into the we buy into that first tier. Yeah. Is that second tier those unknown 
those folks that we have not done. Well, that's the third tier on my proposal. The, the first tier were the big, big people that are doing things that clearly qualify for the H tax <coughs> and do it year after year. They need the continued funding from the H tax that they're helping generate. They're bringing people in and generating the H tax. The second tier would be the groups that are a little bit smaller. They may need right. some um, some financial uh, help <laughs> as far as management of their funds. They might have a fiscal agent, uh, but th they're still uh, eligible. All of it has to be eligible for the H tax. The third group, I was going to suggest, they set aside for new groups that would be doing innovative things. And I noticed that the committee this year did put several things in there that were. I would consider innovative. And then the fourth tier would be the capital projects, and we have around $500,000 or maybe more now since we went up on CMA. Uh, we have around $500,000 that are circulating in and out. And as we roll somebody off, uh, did we roll Adventure off this year? Is that the one? The capital project. Yeah, we rolled Adventure capital project off at $125,000, I believe. That, that would go back into the pot, and then we could take, we could, the, the council could agree on the next one that would be in line. And as the Centennial Park rolls off next year, we could have a next one coming in line. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with the tier process. What I have a problem is, is that, that I don't think that we have to have the receipts turned in. Because to me, what I've seen proves that the system ain't working correctly. And until that's done, you can't just let it. Let it well, go wild. Y all, y all, I'm bowing to the financial geniuses. Yeah, y'all are talking about. I don't think you're speaking inconsistent with one another. We're talking about our oversight responsibilities, and, and then obviously trying to be as efficient as possible yeah. and, and making sure we get some things done. Uh, we got um, a lot of organizations doing a whole lot of good work. I mean, um, some uh, that are a lot more mature and larger, and standing on their own. Some that uh, will need our help crucially. I, that is going to require much more involved discussion uh, uh, that we have time for today but we need but if we're going to if we're going to deal with it and it's probably the perfect time meaning this year to, to, to deal with it um, uh, over the long term I've still got to digest I think I, I gave Dee, Dee a heart attack when I told her I was I, I was unready uh, to act uh, uh, tonight and some of you have expressed the same unreadiness and digest this a little bit more but um, uh, but the larger discussion is when we have to have yes, with again, the, the focus on, on on doing our due diligence, making sure that folks are using these funds in an accountable manner. <coughs> yes, and making sure that we're focusing on, on, on equity and, and equitable distribution. Uh, yes, making sure we're, we're able to focus on not just the year-to-year -year issues, but also these some of these um, cornerstone opportunities that give us a chance to, to really make some leaps forward. How we make these um, significant capital investments that. Um, um, some that will only come up every every several years, um, but it's a um, um, uh, it's important for us to recognize that <coughs> all these groups have significant value. Let's figure out how we can do it within the um, within the limited means that we have, which I will say, maybe limited but still substantial. I mean, so we're we're, we're, we're spending millions of dollars a year, mm -hmm. uh, so that that ought not be. The value of it ought not be understated. It, yes, sir, Mr. Duval. It, it sounds like we, we have a kind of consensus that we need to study the tier process, and we have a, uh, a consensus that we need to get, get more uh, control over our reimbursement process, but we do need to have mm -hmm. the receipts. The, the one point that we um, I would like to clarify is uh, the, uh, the proposal also had a multi-year funding, a two-year funding, that we would true up each year to give groups, let's say like the Nickelodeon that are having events all the time, an opportunity to know that they that they wouldn't be dependent on us voting tonight because the budget year is going to start July 1. They would have some certainty of, of, of funds going forward. It would be like a city or a county doing a two-year budget. Are you suggesting then that, that they apply for it? Two years of funding. Uh, you could do it that way, or you. The way I had envisioned it was that's a good process. That's a good word for the 
Uh, way I envision it is it would be a one-year funding, and then you would have a percentage of that, maybe 75% of that you could count on going into the next year, and then the council at the end, when we're doing it in June, we could we could verify. Their, Sometimes you got to verify, yeah. Yeah, so you, but, you would have a you would have a base that you would know that you'd be getting, but then we would. You'd have a guarantee base. We would add a year on every year. So it would roll. It would be a rolling amount that we would control every year. I know that all, you would do that, but uh, I wouldn't. Um, I'd make sure that somehow we still don't give the appearance of a guarantee again. Yeah. None of it is guaranteed. Yeah. Well, it, it, there would be caveats in there, as right. there are on a couple of cities in the state that do multiple-year budgets. Right. Don't have a problem with that. I, I thought we were going to really deal with that model before we yeah. um, sat down with that. We're pretty close on something that I think we can hammer out, Mr. Mayor, with uh, just a little time. But I, I don't think you can hold this up because no. you've already had the committee meet on these. I, I think that you would Yeah. No, no. I mean, you need to set a time, and because we've been talking about it since last year, so you need to set a time, say when you're going to discuss it, when we're going to approve something so it could be in place uh, for agree. subsequent years. I think we're talking, we're talking about 18, 19. Right. At, okay. at, at so, the soonest. Yeah, I, I, I still have unreadiness about these. I want to make sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I have some so we're we're still going to meet about unreadiness with all so, of this. Yeah. Yeah. Can, as we move forward on this process, Ms. Wilson. Yes, sir. Can we put a subcommittee together to work with Ms. Alonzo and Dee and others to look at examples of what's not acceptable in our current guidelines and then tweak, but also create a better system for us of tracking? Yes, sir. A subcommittee of council. And, and Ms. Alonzo and, and staff and Dee Dee and whoever else to be in, but I do think we need to have a, a, a revision of our process. And if we're going to build it into the tier, I think it's very critical that we do that. Yeah. Didi. Yes, sir. This discussion is about us, not you. You did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> you stepped in and did a good job. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Is there a time frame that you all would like for us to get you together? In the fall or? Well, I mean, since yeah, we're, since we're really be. talking about for ne next year's application start, we need to have it finished before Christmas. Okay. Right. So sure. that it can have plenty of time to be published and circulated. You can give us a whole lot of coattails. Yeah. I'm not yeah, ready, I don't to think vote ready to on vote on it, but I was just saying we couldn't hold this up for that. I, no, no, I completely yeah. agree. Um, mm -hmm. So you can't just be mad at me, Didi. I'm not. I'm not. I'm sorry, sir. That was for not, this evening, not not approving it yet. This evening, the item. Yes, sir. I would like to know, Diddy. I'm sorry, yes, Mr. Mayor. I'm sorry. Ms. Devine had something I think Mr. Stevenson was asking. A question. I just want to clarify. It sounded like y'all are not going to vote on H tax tonight. Not unless you're planning on bringing us, you know, pizza and beer. Well, I can always do that. I'd be very glad to do that. Um, We're easily bought. Well, it's not very often I show up on the uh, the agenda of council. It's usually for some other nefarious reason than this. But um, I just want to know whether we need to be back for that. No, the eight no. or eight tax, no. No. For either one. Either one. Okay. Unless you have, unless you have other issues on the agenda. Well, I, there are uncomfortable issues on the agenda. Might be fun. Yeah. Uh, what, what my question just was for, um, for Dee Dee and or John. Um, I, I didn't see the application, so I wasn't sure. I know in years past, um, we've had some, some creative suggestions on how 
you know, people are promoting the increase of the pot, people eating out and other things. I've heard heard that as much recently, so I didn't know if, if organizations were kind of getting away from that. But to, to Howard's point about increasing the pot, we really do need to push that as something that we're looking to see in That's what they're doing. So I don't know if you saw it this year. Are you all seeing that people or groups are getting away from that, or where are we on that? We do. We do always encourage that. That is where the money comes from. So we encourage that, that be part of the entire process, that they do that in their okay. events. And, sh and that will be asked by the committee at their presentation and also from the information we receive in the application we ask um, the amount of food and beverage that was sold and we have a three-year tier that we can see if it's um, getting more attendance getting more food and beverage sales if they're um, growing or if they're not growing um, that is one of the things in the application yeah I'm just Did wondering that answer I'm, yeah but no like in years past like like the ballet would do a thing that you know if you ate out you got something and so it, it encouraged people if you're buying a ballet ticket also to eat out and it, it, it pushed that encouragement and I haven't seen or heard of that as much recently so I was just wondering are y'all seeing it because I'm not reading the applications like I used to. Actually yes we're seeing it a lot from the organizations that count on this money for their operations for the season. It's ongoing that you would have a patron's table in the lobby for many different events telling people where to, to go to eat, make, helping them make reservations. Um, they pass out surveys. So we see that pretty regularly. And this year as a committee, knowing that this was going to be sort of a, a real topic of discussion for council, as a committee we asked Dee, Dee to give you our procedures and policies that we used as a committee so that it didn't look like we were just making arbitrary decisions but that we actually were following a process. And this year we had 20 new applications, but not uh, an increase in the dollars. As as a committee, we'd asked for a percentage increase year after year after year, uh, based on the growth or the decrease of those revenues themselves. And that hasn't come in. But we think, truthfully, that the city is doing a really fine job in meeting the spirit of the legislation and helping arts organizations, historic organizations, community enrichment organizations to grow and develop. And this year we were able to give seed money to, to several smaller organizations that hadn't had that before. And seed money for us with a limited amount of dollars was really small. But addressing some, one of the things that Mr. Rickerman had, had said was, do we look at um, reserve accounts? If we looked at reserve accounts, there'd be absolutely no way that as a committee we could in good conscience be able to fund the uh, Gamecock Club for their police support. But every year that money comes right out of the HDAC's uh, pocket. So, you know, we, we do try to look at it every way. We try to look at small organizations. We try to give them seed money. And some of the smaller organizations that get a certain dollar amount from the committee go back to council and get an increase. So when we see them again the coming year, we give them an increase over what we had the previous year, not what they had gotten with the council increase. So it gets very muddy in that way. And we also know in reimbursables with these organizations that we stress they can have them for marketing, they can have them for security, and they can have them for talent. And in some instances, which has to be discussed with, excuse me, with Didi, would be for a marketing position. So we know how the reimbursables work. Um, I think, right, I think but y'all don't need the reimbursement. I think part of it was just about practice when it comes through whether or not we, we, we really do see these organizations do the best that they can, even to the point where a lot of the committee members attend, attend organizational events. And if we don't see that that organization is even collecting zip codes, that's discussed at the committee. And that's a simple way just to, to see who's showing up and who's not. Or we had one organization that was promoting an event for the community, 
but was doing the event, was proposing to do the event, so far outside the community that one of our questions was, how do you propose to transport people? What, what have you thought about for transportation? And they really hadn't thought about that. So it was something we said, please go back to your drawing board. So we really do review these applications in, in great depth yeah. I think and trying to make it easier for you guys to make decisions and determinations. You guys do, you guys do great work. And I think, you know, again, we're talking about a, a, a positive tension. I think it is. There's a whole lot of good to be done, a whole lot of good being done. And I just think every, every um, so often, I'm not sure if it's every couple of years, every several years, we got to go okay. back and make sure you know, okay. we're, we're doing exactly what we want to do. And, and sometimes council's priorities change, as long as the, mm -hmm. the spirit of, of what we, of what our legislation uh, intended, we're in good shape. But we got to go back and make sure that some of the accountability issues, some of the long-range planning issues, some of the ongoing equity or regional issues that we're addressing those. And, um, One of those things in the infancy of, of the, the process was the staging that Mr. Duval brought up. It was at the time when there were so few festivals and the city had a city stage that the festivals were encouraged to use the city stage the rather than the mobile stage rather than the red one. So historically, that's where that sits. You've never seen it? Yeah. It's a tractor trailer with the one wall. Is, is Missy going to have to explain the financials? I was waiting for you all to finish this portion. Are you? Because we do okay. need to well, so we transition. Go to session real soon. Yeah. I, thought I thought this was the last thing. We have something this else? This is the last thing. I think Mr. DeVos, just as a part of this item, wanted Missy Kaufman to talk about your HTAS budget going forward, correct? This one? The 1819? The June 4th, well, let's, let's, let's 20. Let's get those questions because we got to go to executive session thereafter. Well, I can wait. Are you sure? I can get with Missy. Okay. Recognizing that our John. our budget is based off some pretty um, aggressive predict predictions, I guess. Well, this is just for the hospitality. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I gotcha. We're going to have another eclipse this August. We are. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Projections, I should have said, versus predictions. I just one quick thing. I wanted to take the opportunity, Mr. Mayor, when all of your colleagues are chatting loudly. <laughs> with us for several weeks now. How long, Pamela? Two months. Okay, two months. And she's doing a phenomenal job. Um, comes from Houston, Texas. What part of Texas? By way of Okay, Dallas, Fort Worth. Exceptional. Yes, exceptional addition. We're glad to have her back home, and she has jumped right in to help us. I know that I really wanted to make sure all of you knew she was here because this is a position I know all of y'all have been 
um, you know, particularly interested in us having. Yeah. Yes. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you, Pamela. So, yes, sir, we are going to be part of our executive. All right, yeah, uh, can, we get a, can we get a motion? And I think so move. an amendment oh, doesn't need a little longer than that. I move that we go into executive session for discussion and negotiation and incident proposed contractual work arrangements pursuant to 30-4-70A2, uh, Capital Edge, Alvin Glenn, Rate Increase, Magic Ice, USA, Columbia Canal, Healthcare, discussion of employment of an employee pursuant to 70A2, Municipal Court, receipt of legal advice where the legal advice relates to a pending, threatened, or potential claim. Brinkman versus City of Columbia, Waccamaw Avenue speed bumps, City of Columbia versus Polaris, uh, discussion of matters related to proposal location or expansion of services to encourage the location or expansion of industries or other business pursuant to 70A2, diversified development, ju juicy, spec building, and 1649 culinary training program. And, oh, wait a minute. Uh, and, one more. Uh, receipt of legal advice pertaining to threatening a potential claim um, Stephen Avenue. So I'm second. Any discussion? Say nothing with the previous question. Clerk, call roll. Mr. Rickman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. McGraw? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mr. Evans? Aye.